Good morning, folks. Uh, we come to the second part of Psalm 51. And can I say two things? If you haven't uh, listened to the first part, it's Psalm 51, two words. Can I really encourage you to do so? Because uh, it will be a, a helpful uh, foundation for this second part. And second of all, if you haven't read the Psalm again, or, or second, certainly from verse seven, can I encourage you to pause the video now and read the Psalm? We come again to uh, begin at around about verse 7 when David says, Cleanse me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. David wanted God to do a work uh, of spiritual cleansing in him and to do it uh, in a way that no one else could do it. Hyssop was one of those things that was used to apply the blood of the Passover lamb. And so you can read about that in Exodus chapter 12. It was also used to sprinkle the, the priest's purifying water. You'll find that in Numbers 19. So in the Levitical law, it was the priests who used hyssop. And that's really very important. David was calling on God to be his priest. He was the only one he knew who could declare him cleansed from his sin. He knew as we know that we cannot cleanse ourselves. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow, he says. He knows that God's cleansing is effective. And his sin, well, it was like it was a deep stain that needed purified. I can remember a number of years ago, going through a di difficult situation with someone and feeling that because of what I felt about them, that I had this little black spot on my heart. And that's what it seemed like uh, that was affecting the rest of my heart. And so I remember getting down on my knees before God and saying, God, you're the only one who can cleanse that, who can, can wipe that away, that, that dark stain. And he really did. You know, the preacher Spurgeon uh, said this, God could make him as if he had never sinned at all. Such is the power of the cleansing work of God upon the heart that he can restore innocence to us and make us as if we had never been stained with the transgression at all. What an incredible miracle, folks. David's brokenness was so severe. He goes on to say that it felt as if his very bones were broken. I know having you know, broken a bone in my life, how very painful that is. And you will know that too. So that sense of, of David saying, let the bones you have crushed rejoice. There's such a sense of pain and, and sorrow, isn't there? Um, And David could pray that if God would help him, it would lead to joy and gladness and that out of his brokenness, he would rejoice. You know, folks, restoration is God's goal in our repentance. And, and that indeed should be our goal whenever we're trying to restore people too. If you think about uh, work in prisons, surely it has to be to try to restore people out of their brokenness and their sinfulness. And yes, what awful things they do to society. Restoration is always God's goal in our repentance. And so when we go to verse 10 and 11, David says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. You know, David didn't just want to be cleansed from his sin, a cleaned heart, if you like. He wanted a new heart. In this, he anticipated one of the great promises of all who believe, that Ezekiel 36 tells us, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of you, uh, out of your flesh and give you, uh, uh, and give you a heart of flesh. And the word, the Hebrew word for create that we see in this passage is a word bara, which is also used in Genesis 1 for creation of the heavens and the earth. So it's only God who can create a new heart in us out of nothing. And so what David is asking is for a miracle. 
And maybe that's what you're in need of today, folks, for whatever hurt or pain or stain is in your heart today. It's only God who can change that, transform that, replace it with a new heart, not just a polished up one. David says, renew a steadfast spirit within me. So along with a new and clean heart, David was asking for this sense of a steadfast spirit. And what this expression means is complete and utter dependency on God. A firm spirit, able to resist the enemy. That's what he's asking for. Because he knows, like we know, how the enemy loves to tempt us and take us away from our path with God. You may be going through that time of temptation right at this moment. It could be it could be anything. It could be doing to do with relationships or money or the time that you have in your hands and the computer in front of you. It could be just to to really want to speak out words of of frustration and aggression, whatever it is that at this moment you are tempted with. Please, like David, ask that God would renew a steadfast, a firm spirit within you that you are able to deal with the enemy and you can battle on because you have God's spirit in you. And David then goes on in verse 11, do not cast me away from your presence. Uh, do not take your spirit from me. And this, David is saying, don't let me be like Saul who went before me. Because as we know from the story of Saul, the spirit um, left Saul. Uh, it had departed from him. You know, not to be in God's presence, there is nothing worse for us. That, and that is the immediate effect of our sin, to alienate us from God, to be away from God's presence. And we don't want that. Hell is not being in the presence of God. And David was crying out, don't let me be like, like, the, like the one before me, Saul. Please never. And he never did. Which is interesting. This man after God's own heart. God was always with him through the trials, through the temptations, through the sin. And he will be with you folks if you depend on him cry out to him. He will never leave you or forsake you. The Lord Jesus has promised that. It's very important to remember that. And we come to verses 12 to 13. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressions, your transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. The restoration of the joy of salvation was the prize. For, for repenting and being restored. And he once again experienced that joy. He'd gone from his spiritual defeat and he, in his confidence in God, um, he felt joy again. And you know, I know you're maybe like me folks, whenever you've been through a time when you know you have a stain of sin in your heart, there is no joy at that time. We feel uh, that we let God down, we let others down. And my sense is that the enemy at this time has been stealing joy from God's people. Do you feel that? Do you find that? We have allowed the, the very difficult, horrendous situation to get on top of us. I know I'm hearing that from a number of people. And there have been days when I have felt it myself. And I refuse to allow the enemy to, to uh, remove my joy, to steal my joy, especially the joy of my salvation. So folks, don't let him do it. Remember the renewed spirit within you, the steadfast spirit. And like David, let us ask God, please God, restore joy in me. I want to be countercultural. I want to be different than the world. I don't want to be dealing with this lockdown like everybody else who doesn't know you does. Because we are called to be fish who let, like go against the flow. That's the image that I want you to remember. And so David then says, and this is wonderful in verses 14 to 17. Save me from blood kill, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. 
O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Wow. So David, his sin dealt with, could sing again. And, you know, I have heard so many times from people who have gone through a really difficult time in their life, often caused by just some bad choices, who find themselves in church and can't open their mouths. It caused a silence of the spirit of praise in them. If that's you at the moment, again, I encourage you guys, get down on your hands and knees and repent and ask God to restore your joy and allow you to sing again, to praise him. And it, it for an example, after you finish the study, wait till I finish, put some praise music on and sing to your heart's content. Go to a different room if someone else is in the house. Go outside in your garden if you have a garden. Go into the loo. And for those Americans who might be watching, that's the, the bathroom or the, the toilet. And sing out your praises to God, just like David did. And then he goes on to say that he knows God doesn't want animal sacrifices because what God is really interested in, what God desires, is not the ritual it's our heart. David could have given so many different kinds of offerings. He was a rich, powerful man. But he knew that God doesn't want that. God wants, he says, in verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. That's what he wants. Rituals, folks, are empty if our hearts are not in it. You you take the, the sacraments that we have as part of our church liturgy and doctrine and that they are baptism and, and communion, the Lord's Supper. There is no uh, uh, point in standing up and making vows that you don't mean that you're going to bring up your child in the life and teaching of Jesus and in the church. They are empty rituals if you do that. They are meaningless. And for communion, if your heart is hard, if your heart is hard and, and you're walking in sin or you have not chosen to live for Jesus or to ask Jesus into your life and your heart to be saved, to have him as Lord and Saviour, what's the point in taking communion? That's what David is saying. These rituals, these sacrifices, they are empty and meaningless if our hearts are not in it. Attending church singing, praying even, if you're just doing the ritual. A broken spirit that David is talking about is a spirit where all our ego is gone. It's not about us. We are completely and utterly dependent on God. A contrite heart is a one that's not stubborn and it's not rebellious, but is fully engaged with God. That's what God wants, David says. And he goes on to say this, God doesn't despise. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. I think maybe David knows that the world or the society that he's in, and definitely for us today, expects a leader to be powerful and strong and proud. Whatever he does, He's expected to be this amazing king. But what David is saying here is, I don't care what the world thinks. If God doesn't despise my broken, contrite heart, he doesn't, he doesn't care what anybody else thinks. If you remember the story, of course, of him dancing for joy as he, he brings the ark back, he didn't care. And I know some people really struggle with that image. I've heard them in Bible studies say, you know, he wasn't being very, um, uh, you know, very nice or uh, he was making a fool of himself. And that was absolutely the point because his heart was worshipping God. He was dancing for God. He wasn't dancing for those around him. And folks, we need to deal with this if it's a problem for us. If we are only interested in what other people think about us, 
especially when it comes to church, even something as simple as our desire to lift our hands like this in worship on a Sunday morning. But we're too scared because what will the person beside us think? What will the person in front of us, they might look at us. Do you know what? What David is saying, who cares? Because you're doing it because your heart is for God. And by doing that, you're, 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 you're biblically worshipping because all the words for worship contained in the scriptures are all to do with physical acts, lifting our hands, prostrating ourselves. Some of those things all have to do with parts of our body. Kneeling. Never be ashamed of those things. David is saying, because God, you do not despise them. You delight in them. You know, here we have a man, verses 18 and 19, he says this, In your good pleasure make Zion prosper, build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. David doesn't... He recognises he hadn't just failed as a man or a husband or a father. And of course he had by all the sin in his life. He had also failed as a king. And he here finishes by humbly asking God to restore favour to his kingdom. That, my friends, is a really important point that David ends this psalm with. Because I believe that this time in this generation, uh, we need to see a leadership who, who walk in humility, who walk in compassion, who have only the best for their people, not their own ego or power for themselves. And what we see around the world at this moment in time, and I think what we've seen for many of our leaders to deal in dealing with COVID-19 is just that. It's about them. I have been appalled by some of the comments of world leaders, our own and others. I expect the people who have uh, leadership over us to walk in humility and integrity. And I will pray for them and I do pray for them every day. But David is pointing out that he had failed as a leader and he is repenting of it. Oh, that we would have leaders who would do the same. And until they do, folks, will you pray for them? Especially in this very sensitive, difficult time as a coming out of lockdown for many nations in the world. We need people who are discerning and wise. And that means they need our prayers. What a wonderful psalm. Let me just finish by giving you some steps for real repentance, just um, to finish with. A penance, repentance means it's a process often. It's not just a, a, a one uh, moment time. For many of us, it, it takes time as we process. And as we take time, joy will be cultivated in us. So, first thing, understand what your sin is. Know that it is something that keeps you from God. It means that your life and some of your choices and mine have been off the mark. They're not what God intended. But I want to say one thing. Often we think, oh, we're just useless. We're just rubbish. And we allow the enemy just to, I call it, puke all over us. God's spirit, he comes and he defines our sin. He says, see that little black stain? That needs to be repented of. It's a specific thing that the spirit does. The enemy just goes, you're just rubbish and makes us feel rubbish. God is specific. So discern if there is sin, what it is, a specific sin. Then the second thing, folks, appeal to the mercy of God. Appeal for forgiveness. 
But based on what you know about God's character, he is a forgiving, loving, compassionate God. Forgives you 70 times 7. In other words, every time. The third thing I would say is avoid justifying or being defensive. Well, actually, I had every right to treat that person like that because look at what they did to, her, to me. It doesn't matter, folks. If you know that it's brought hardness of heart, you need to repent. I need to repent. The fourth thing is look to him, look to God. This word uh, that David uses of hyssop is not accidental. It does mean purification with blood. And that's Exodus 24. It, it, one shedding of blood can make us clean and whiter than snow. And for us, we know that's all about Jesus. Hebrews 9, 26 tells us that he sacrificed himself. He was the great high priest. So look to him, the Lord Jesus. Pray to him. Number five, ask God to break us and to heal us. David didn't know until Nathan came to him, or he wasn't willing to, to put his hands up to it, that he was a broken man. God breaks us in order to reset us and heal us. So allow him to. It might be painful for a, a day or two, but ultimately for the rest of our life, it will be the best thing. I know. Then number six, allow God's spirit to comfort you. David is grieved at his sin. God is working in him. God is comforting him. God is there with him. And this is the same for us. I wonder, have you ever been so upset or discouraged by your sin that you've wondered, how can God love me? Surely I can't be loved by God. Surely I can't be a Christian if I've done that. If that's what you're thinking, that's a sign that God's spirit is working in you because you know then you have to repent. But allow God to comfort, believe and trust. Get your helmet of salvation on that you understand who God is. And he is a God who loves you and knows you very hair upon your head. And he's with you as you walk through this time. And then number seven, rejoice and proclaim the truth. You know, often uh, what we do is we feel unworthy and we draw back from God or we draw back from other people because we think if they knew, really knew us, they wouldn't like us. But what David does is he says, I, I, I'm going to tell others. My tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. So he's going to tell other people about how good God is. And, and what he's done for him. And I know, folks, that's maybe a hard thing. It's against some of our personalities because we're private and we're, we don't like really talking about ourselves. But just think about how you could tra help transform someone else's life if you are open and vulnerable and say, this is how God healed me. This is how God cleansed me. This is what he cleansed me from. And then... What I encourage you to do after that whole thing is resolve to obey. The mark of repentance is a broken and contrite heart that is in obedience to God and his ways and his will. What a wonderful psalm, folks, full of such truth. But here we see this amazing God who transforms this man who did all sorts of of sinful things, maybe worse than we've ever even thought of, and yet transformed him, cleansed him, set him on a new path, gave him joy and resilience, and allowed him to go on in leadership, this man after God's own heart. We too can be the same. If we allow God's Spirit to speak, if we repent, then he will cleanse us. And renew us and change us from the inside out. Two words, turn around. Let us pray. Hmm. God, we ask that in the stillness now, 
that you would come by your spirit. That if we need convicted, that you would do that. That you would show us the little stain, the little spot of sin in our heart. And then you would help us to process that as we, we ask you to forgive us and cleanse us and renew us and create in us that contrite heart and that steadfast spirit. Lord, I pray that you would protect us from the constant badgering of the enemy. If we are feeling I'm not good enough, I can't do this, or who would love me, let alone God. Lord, would you, uh, I, I want to speak against that in Jesus' name. And would you come by your spirit reminding us of the truth of this psalm. That you love us. And you will forgive us every time. And would you, Lord, if for many of us, I believe, restore to us the joy of salvation and allow us to speak to others of what you're doing in us. Come, Lord Jesus, come. You are the one who made the ultimate sacrifice. You are the, the great high priest. Thank you, Lord that you have made a way for us to be cleansed and renewed and forgiven. And Lord, if there are some of us who have not yet recognised that and who need to give our lives to you this day to ask you to be Lord and Saviour, Lord, would you speak to them? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come bless each one watching and listening now that we might be a people of hope and of joy who have been restored and renewed. In your name we pray. Amen. Bless you folks. <laughs>